Well, that's Sam Neill. That's very good. I want people to very much focus, if we're going to talk symbolism of the film, I want them to focus on the fact of how these are Christian, pro-Christian films probably made and scripted by Jesuits. Mm-hmm. So it's very important for people to realize how nature and animals are portrayed in the Christian mind think. And if you watch the Omen movie, you'll always notice that Damien, and Damien, the character, is connected with Satan or the devil. Mm, yeah, sure. For those who've never watched it, observe how Damien is a lover of animals mm. and is very much connected to nature, you see, mm. whereas the so-called Christians are very much against it. So this is one of the subtexts there that I want to, people to focus on, which is very much found throughout the whole of Western art, is this whole ambivalence towards animals and nature and darkness <coughs> and the forests and dark places and storms, Mm -hmm. you know, and animals are connected with evil. (laughs) Watch how this programming, because we're talking about programming here, that's a big programming motif that went through all the horror movies from Salem's Lot to Poltergeist with Spielberg, Mm -hmm. and it's still a very, very prevalent theme. (laughs) If anything is demonic in this world, that is. (laughs) And Hollywood and these movies are responsible for a very, very subtle form of programming over years that has demonized nature. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest ways that people have been programmed to fear the dark and fear the night and fear the moon and owls <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and whatever else yeah. has yeah. been actually through the programming of quote unquote horror movies. Sure. And the Omen series is a very, very good example of that, uh, as is Salem's Lot. You know, it seems like a re- reflection on the you know cl- classical uh, thing about the you know the the Jesuit when went uh, you know over to South America and teaching that they, you know the that the devil lived in the forests i mean they tried yeah. to get people afraid of of you know, again <laughs> you know using nature or being in nature even oh absolutely and mm. i mean of course people are people who've really looked into this of course are familiar with this but i just want to emphasize it for people who are coming to this kind of subject of symbolism for the first time it's very important to have with fresh eyes to see exactly how this is done mm. these dramatic devices you know so pay attention to that because this has a tremendous effect on the mind and people have embodied it yeah people have embodied these memes and these sub themes uh, uh, meta themes mm. um all right want to move on we have uh, we could get to either fight club or v for vendetta well v for vendetta follows on from just what i've been saying that uh, again psychological uh, very heavily psychological film on one level mm-hmm. you know about the persona and about the, the gods of the underworld you know i mean v is 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 obviously Even the letter V is interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, it connects to Beethoven's uh, Fifth Symphony. Sure. Um, this is, is one of the meta themes: is the music of the movie and the fact that number five. Yeah. You know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is, is the rebellious symphony, the symphony of rebellion against the system. Mm-hmm. But the idea that he's disfigured, he has to wear a mask, is a very, very you know interesting slant on the on the gods of the underworld. And of course, he actually does exist in a place called the Shadow Gallery. Mm-hmm. And then you have the, the idea of the feminine, the female person, having to come in and face her shadow and be put through an incredible ordeal, mm-hmm. which she actually takes for reality. But you know, in the story, just like in Hellboy, the female person, exactly like in Frankenstein, the original stories, and in the Mummy, very rare to find that the female actually does, in fact, transcend and does, in fact, merge with the shadow. Mm-hmm. Most movies, and most in most art and literature, uh, and also in real life, it's almost zero. That yeah. a feminine, a female ever transcends in that in that particular way mm-hmm. when they happen to be going through any type of underworld experience. Mm-hmm. It's very rare for that to happen, and when it does, it usually does not come off at all. Yeah. And very rarely in literature or art do you ever see it, you know, coming through to its spiritual uh, fulfillment. Now in Hellboy you do see that, and also in V for Vendetta you do see that. Mm-hmm. And this is a very powerful archetype as well. Hmm. But uh, you know, I just love the the fact that um, the female is called Evie. Mm-hmm. Her second name is Hamon. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to be an expert in uh, symbolism to realize that Eve represents Eve, mm-hmm. and Hamon represents Amon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. The gods of the sun and the moon sure. connected. A lot of symbolism there. The idea of um, that, you know, just the fact that his personal motto, V's personal motto, is "By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe." Mm-hmm. So V represents really a transcendent individual. Yeah, you know, a person who is, uh, you know, of God, but in a very anti-social way, mm-hmm. and therefore has not only been marginalized by society, but has been completely, uh, you know, made the outsider. So it's a very outsider type of motif. Yeah, in that film, you know, and that, and again, the idea that, um, you know, 
first of all, I, I personally didn't want to see the movie because as soon as I heard it was about Guy Fox or that there was a Guy Fox type of symbolism involved in the mm-hmm. film, mm-hmm. that that rang a lot of bells for me about the Jesuits and you know. Sure. I thought, here we go. Here's another movie, you know, that's pro Jesuit or pro, you know, this whole new wave of of religion that's sweeping the world. Mm-hmm. But uh, very quickly, you know, it was obvious that this was not about that, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it wasn't about anything to do with that. It was a far more deep analysis against corporatism, corporate America, you know, and the uh, corporate, uh, not corporate America, but the corporate world, mm-hmm. and the whole dehumanization of the human race. You know? Yeah, sure. Well, awesome. I don't know if this is essential to our discussion here, but but uh, uh, it could be interesting if you got any, any take on it. Allegedly, you know, Alan Moore, the, the writer behind the, the comic book, uh, dropped, you know, his name from, from the film because he, he didn't want to, you know, be... Uh, have anything to do with it, basically, because I I, I, th- I guess this was because he thought that the uh, that he was you know his ideas and his story so forth was misrepresented here. Uh, well, there's multiple reasons why that would happen, and obviously one of the most biggest ones that often is very common is that uh, they just they just steamroll right over you. Mm. They take your ideas and they do not do justice to it, or don't include you in the script writing aspects. Mm, mm. And then a writer would obviously, you know, I would certainly. You know, immediately fall foul of them at that point, mm, yeah. or they're trying to steamroll you legally, where they're not giving you, the, you know, enough money or something like that. Mm, mm. Those are the two most obvious reasons, where it's just, it's just basically aesthetic and e- economic breach mm. of contract, or they're just messing with your ideas. You know, this is what so many people, like uh, even Patrick McGowan, you know, have have had to endure. Another reason why that might happen is because it's good publicity. When you hear sure. in the media that the the author is, you know. F- Fighting a war against the studio that brings a lot of media attention to sell the film. It does, yeah. So a lot of this stuff is done as hype, and then they're all big pals later on again. You know, yeah. Uh, you'll find that through the Da Vinci Code, and and you know, the, um, you've got to also realize that there's an entire elaborate, highly, you know, look at the Passion of the Christ, for instance. Mm, yeah. The whole idea it's anti-Semitic. No, it's not. No, the Jews love it. No, they don't. Yes, they do. You know. <laughs> well, let's talk about it. You know, that sold the movie, you know, more than anything else did. Yeah, absolutely. Because the movie actually didn't do very well in England when it first showed. It was actually The Passion of the Christ was incredibly low at the box office in the first week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, "I'm not going to bother with that." Mm. So they respond a lot to pump it, you know, with some kind of controversy, and they'll pull anything out of their bag. Sure, sure. You know, the, the, I mean, with the Omen movies, the, the list of controversy, oh, you know, car crashes, mysterious deaths. I mean, they went to the whole what, nine yards yeah. of, you know, there's about 26 different things. There's plenty of happened to the cast, the crew, the studios, the lights, the cameras, you know, uh, uh, accidents happening on the road and the, yeah. and the clock stopping at 666. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, and a lot of this is, you know, was put out. Yeah. So, of course, you know, how much is true and how much is, you know, hype to sell a movie? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, the whole uh, study in itself. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is uh, I'm always fascinated that in many cases when, you know, you see specials about the movie or something like that, that actually the actors are the ones who are sitting you know, uh, being interviewed about the movie and telling things about the movie. I mean, couldn't it be that, you know, these people still are under contract and in that sense are playing a role to prom- promote or say certain things about a movie and so forth? Well, exactly they are, because, you know, sequels are made. Yeah. Uh, interviews are made. Magazines are made. Books are written. You know, a good movie like The Omens, you know, sparks an entire industry. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do if you've been involved with the original production is to come along and trash it all later. Go, oh, it was just some movie. I was in. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. It's yeah, just exactly. not what you know dramatists do. Yeah. Whether the movie is good or whether it is bad, you're going to get a circulation of just you know trivia, mm. and that's just an inevitable response. You know, when you're dealing in an Iranian mercurial medium, this is one of the the, the things that happens. 